Well, good evening. We want to welcome you to online Wednesday night services here at Calvary Chapel. I'm Mark, and this is Brandon, and uh, we are uh, always glad to uh, get together and study God's Word with you. Uh, we are looking forward to the time when we get to do that back face-to-face, and so actually Brandon has a couple of updates for us if you haven't heard already. Yes, absolutely. We are so excited uh, to announce that the governor, as most of you know, reopened the state of Missouri on May 4th for businesses as well as for gatherings from a distance. And so um, we're excited that uh, although we're not going to be together for Mother's Day, we're going to hold off one more week to give us a little time to prepare mm-hmm. and make sure that things are absolutely as safe as possible uh, here at church. And so we're going to reopen worship at 8.45 and 11 a.m. on May 17th yeah. for our first time back together uh, to worship together six feet apart. Yes. Uh, but yes. but I am so excited. Uh, we're so glad that we're going to be able to do that together. And uh, in the near future and the days ahead, um, before that happens, we're going to be releasing a lot of information yeah. and guidance for our families um, so that uh, everyone can see uh, what we're going to be doing to ensure um, safety, ensure that we're following um, those recommendations set forth. And so we're excited about that. Another announcement mm-hmm. about something coming up uh much sooner is that this Friday night, the middle school group is going to be uh, participating in something called 30 hour famine. And as things aren't opened up yet, we're going to do that virtually. And so you can, they can be checking their Facebook page uh, for the route six, seven, eight, page. Uh, There's going to be text information sent out, but we're going to fast together for 30 hours to raise awareness for world hunger and uh, do some uh, interesting community service ideas from a distance and some things like that. So we're going to have some fun. But Mark, isn't there a deadline tonight? Yes. Yes. So yes. So today, tonight is the uh, deadline to let me know that you're uh, current 8th through 12th grade student would like to attend CIY Move with us this summer. Uh, there is uh, information, there's an event page on our Facebook, as well as uh, there's a link in the description of this video to the form and some information about that. So, uh, and if you have any questions, just contact me. Uh, you can email me at mark at buffalocalvary.com. You can uh, send us a message through Messenger on Facebook, or you can call the church office and love to help you get connected there. Absolutely. And so I think at this time, Mark is going to share with us some prayer requests and some things we can be praying about. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, several things going on this week. Uh, There's several things going on in people's lives we just want to update you about so that we can be praying specifically for these people. Um, uh, Most of you know Rosie Peterson passed away last week. Uh, They're holding uh, some family services for her this week. So, but just be praying for that family. Uh, Such a sweet lady, made a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. And uh, just be praying for them as they... Mark, did you know that Rosie would have been 99 this month? No. Coming up in May. So it's pretty amazing. That is amazing. Life well lived. Yeah, that's right. Um, also, Joe Hill is in the hospital, and we just asked that you be praying uh, about that situation. Bill Shockley's got some significant health concerns going on right now, and so we just be praying for Bill and his family as they go through that. Uh, and then a praise, you know, we are just so glad Bob Dolan's got to come home this week. He is having Absolutely. to travel uh, for, for dialysis, but, uh, but he's sure glad to be home. So, uh, But yeah. be praying for him. This is a, a transition and a change, and uh, he's still got some things to, to walk through. So. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's pray together tonight. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for everything that you do in our lives. Lord, we thank you that, uh, that we're never alone, that we always have you and your presence with us, Lord, that you're always available to us, Lord, and that's just amazing and humbling. And so wherever we're at right now, whatever we're dealing with right now, we just want to be reminded that Uh, that you love us, that you care for us, that you're for us, and that you're with us through this, and that uh, you have everything that we need to face what we're facing right now in our lives. And Lord, we pray for those on this list that we just talked about, and I know there's so many more who've got things going on in their lives, Um, but Lord, we just pray that you would provide them comfort right now. We pray that you provide them strength right now. We provide that uh, you, that you would provide for them just that peace of knowing that you're with them and that whatever the outcome, 
uh, is that it can be okay as long as we put our trust and our hope in you for our future. Uh, so just be with us at this time. Be with us tonight as we study your word, as we um, learn about you and how to serve you and serve others around us better. We just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight we are continuing Bible study uh, in the book of Genesis, and so you want to give us just a little preview of what's going on tonight, Brandon? Yeah, you bet. So tonight, uh, Brother Doug is going to continue in the book of Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to continue with the life of Abraham, Father Abraham. And so I don't know about you guys, but my kids at home, we hear Abraham uh, on Wednesday nights for Bible study, and somebody starts singing Father Abraham. It's without fail. Without yes. fail. Um, and then it gets into mo- you know the motions, and so you know, sing Father Abraham tonight as a family and post a video of it uh, on the comments section. Oh, uh, I'd love to see it and laugh at somebody else besides me. Yes. Uh, but So tonight we're going to be uh, continuing with Father Abraham, but the thing is, um, encouraging to me, Mark, about yeah. tonight is that Abraham faced many trials mm-hmm. and we even call them tests or challenges. Yeah. Um, some that were even given to him by God specifically and he failed. And so it's encouraging to me that, you know, I'm not the only one. <laughs> That's right. I'm not the only one who faces and, those And there trials. is another side. Like, like you get through uh, that if you continue absolutely. to come back to God and His grace. So yeah, Absolutely. And that's yeah. what we see um, repetitively through God and this, these patterns. And we're going to see that in Abraham's life. That even though he failed uh, some tests, um, God had some great things in store for him. Yeah. So yeah, it's exciting. But before we uh, get to the Bible study tonight, aren't we checking in with somebody? I'm super excited about this one. Yeah, All right. we are checking in with uh, Dale and Katie Lane tonight. So let's, let's check that out. Awesome. Hey, Dale and Katie, thank you guys for joining me today. And, uh, and so if, am I correct? Is this your first Zoom meeting? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. So thank you guys for going over that technology barrier to do this and hang out with us tonight. So great to see you guys. You know, we, we've all missed seeing each other. And so this has been kind of a fun way to, to maybe let some familiar faces get out there for everybody to check on people. So, so how, how have you guys been doing during this stay at home social distancing time? We're doing well. Uh, there are some obvious things that we certainly miss a lot. But we've discussed several times that we're fortunate. We have the, uh, it's not changed our schedule that much other than just more time at home. Uh, yeah. but, but we're doing very well. Many people are not doing as well as we are. Yeah. Yeah. We feel very blessed. We have a warm house, <laughs> food, and uh, we cook together. That's one of the things we've enjoyed doing. And we've eaten almost every meal at home. Use our dishwasher more. (laughs) Yeah, I've had lots of reports that people are like having to figure out how to cook at home again. Yeah, it's been a kind of of a fun thing, if not challenging. Yeah, for some people. Yeah, yeah. But we, I miss our friends and family. I like to entertain and have people over, and I like to talk. Yeah, I was gonna say you may be just a little bit social, Katie. Just I (laughs) might be. My (laughs) poor. go to therapy three days a week and I talk the entire hour. Yes, yeah. So, so it's, it's more than just physical therapy, right? Yes, yeah, it is. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not it's not the other therapy. <laughs> So, uh, so with that, you know, I thought maybe you guys might share, uh, we'll start on, on the positive side, then maybe share some challenges. So what, what's maybe been something that's been spiritually refreshing for you with the kind of slow down change in pace? Well, I, I think one of the things that's been really kind of fun for us to, to think about is, uh, it makes us really appreciate the things that are, are normal. Uh, the, uh, we do miss the fellowship with our church family. And, but at the same time, we really, really, I think, appreciate it more than we did before. Yeah. So, yes. Good. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. So, so how about maybe on the challenging side? So, I mean, so that's kind of all intertwined, but, but so is there something particularly that's been spiritually challenging? It, it is intertwined. Uh, sometimes I think for me and just speaking for me, it's a little more challenging for me to put my time in my Bible study, my prayer life. Uh, the day kind of gets away from me sometimes. So I would have to say maybe I could do better there. Uh, we, uh, we've really enjoyed what you guys have been doing, the pastors 
we're so thankful for your leadership and uh, it's great to have the Wednesday night service and the Sunday service and uh, it, it's it's really a good time. Well, thank you for that and and like you said the routine has been a hard thing we're, we are we are creatures of habit one way or the other and and when routines change it's sometimes hard to to keep on track with the healthy things in our lives yeah yeah it's so yeah that's what we're all all striving for right now isn't it yeah when we when we do meet again uh, i think our church family will really be ready to be together yeah, i agree I agree. So, um, so I thought tonight, so we're continuing on Wednesday night studying the book of Genesis. We're, we're in Abraham's life, kind of the start of it. Um, and we get to the story tonight of, of where he uh, uh, tells some things that aren't true and, uh, and kind of some of the consequences and challenges of that. So I thought it might be fun for us to play an old youth group game, which, um, you know, I was thinking about this. What was so cool to me is you guys have been a huge part of my life for, for a lot of years. And uh, when I first started coming to church and started working in youth ministry, you guys were key in that. You were, you were down there helping me on Wednesday nights. You, you guys really prayed for me and helped me walk through a lot of that, which uh, was just, I mean, some foundational stuff for me. Uh, so I thought it's fun that we get to play an old youth group game together tonight. So, 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 so the way Two Truths and a Lie works is that um, we'll, we'll take turns. I, maybe I'll go first and then you guys will go second. But I'm going to share with you three things about myself. Two of them are true and one of them are a lie. And you have to tell me which one you think is a lie. And so obviously what we get to figure out, Katie, is which one of us uh, is the best liar, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad my son Nathan's not doing this because you can tell immediately. <laughs> Very good. All right. So I'll go. Here are my three statements. You guys tell me which one of these is a lie. Okay. First, I once spoke at the Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Second, when I was in college, I went to get a tattoo but passed out when I saw the needle, so I never got the tattoo. Uh, and then three, I saw Tanya Harding, the fallen figure skating star box at a live boxing event so oh which one goodness. of those is a lie those are some outstanding things <laughs> what do you think i think number three is a lie the tanya, tanya harding thing you think that's what you want to go with i think mark would have passed out if he went to get a tattoo <laughs> <laughs> so final answer tanya harding all right, we'll go with number three. Okay, that was true. So oh. um, I, I did speak at the Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. when I was in sixth grade. I won a national essay contest and went <laughs> there and spoke. Um, I did see Tanya Harding box in Branson. Uh, oh a kid in our youth group was in a boxing club and they had an event there and she was like, in the boxing circuit I, and we showed up and so she boxed live uh she lost by the way and uh <laughs> and, but i never ever went to go get a tattoo that's oh, a lot okay that's but you would have passed out <laughs> i probably would have passed out i i'm a i'm a passer outer when i see needles that, that has happened to me before so all right so how about you guys give me your okay. your three things we've chosen three things uh we are celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary later this summer so we decided to make our statements kind of based on our early relationship. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here they are. Number one, on our first two dates, Katie hardly spoke or paid any attention to me. That's hard to swallow. Yep. <laughs> Number two, on one of our early dates, we waited a long time in the auto line to get into the drive-in theater. And when we finally got up there, I didn't have any money. Oh, wow. Okay. Number three, we decided to make the commitment. I bought her engagement ring when we were 19 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So, uh, so Katie didn't talk, had, had, didn't have money at the drive-in theater, or you got engaged when you're 19. All right. So I'm... Uh, Boy, that's, that's tough. And I, by the way, I love that, that you made it about your 50th wedding anniversary. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go with the, um, I'm going to go with the didn't have money at the auto line, at the drive-in movie theater. Okay. That one's true. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Katie has often said she should have taken that 
as an early sign. <laughs> she did it. The first one on our first two dates, Katie hardly spoke to me. That's true. It's true. Yeah. Because we weren't dating each other. We were on double dates and she was with the other guy. Oh. <laughs> two different guys. <laughs> <laughs> so she talked a lot to them, but not to me. Yeah. The one that's not true is I bought her engagement ring when we were 19 years old. Yeah. We actually did get engaged and we did get a ring, but she paid for it. I did. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I was working full time. I could afford it. <laughs> that is great. He was a poor college student and I was desperate. <laughs> uh, oh, man. So it was funny. So I did pay for our engagement ring for Shannon, but she'll tell you uh, early on, she paid for a lot of our dates because she was she had more money than I did. <laughs> and she just wanted to hang out with me. So, <laughs> so I can appreciate that. So, oh, all right. Well, I guess I guess it's a, a, I don't know if it's a tie or a double loss, but yeah, neither <laughs> of us could figure each other out. So, but guys, thank you for spending time with us today and, uh, and playing our game and just checking in with people. It's really good to see you guys. And we hope to see you guys uh, in, in real life very, very soon. So, all right. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. We love our church family. We are so blessed. Yeah, we're so, we're so also proud of our leadership. Thank you guys for all you're doing. Hey, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're so glad you're here. Tonight we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 12 verses 10 through 20. And we're going to be looking at when uh, a godly person fails. Several years ago, our family vacationed in Williamsburg, Virginia. And at one of our trips, we toured a restored church from the 16th century. Being a pastor, I was very interested in the pulpit area. And I was so surprised that the pulpit was way up above everyone else. It was called a pedestal. The preacher looked down on the congregation and the congregation looked up at the pastor. That's how the expression putting someone on a pedestal came about. The bad thing about that pedestal is that you're looking down on people. That's, that's not good for pastors to do. But also people are looking up to you. And sometimes people get this very confused. Often we expect holy men and women to stand apart from the crowd like superhumans. We put them on pedestals and we look up to them. But God is not so easily impressed. He knows the stuff uh, that leaders are made from, and he wants us to remember this too, that none of us are perfect. We tend to think that our church leaders and pastors especially don't ever struggle with the same issues that we do, yet the scripture reveals quite the opposite. When people raise their leaders to illegitimate heights in Acts we find the church rebuked. When we raise our leaders to these heights either we're going to be greatly disappointed or greatly deceived. Godly men and women are simply humans and they have failure in their lives just like everybody else. Today's lesson shows a great failure of a great man. The man is Abraham the father of the Hebrew family. He's the first of the patriarchs, and this is the beginning of a great journey that God is taking us on through his word as he's beginning to reveal himself to a special group of people called the Hebrews. Well, introducing Adels of Bearboin's reality into your thinking is good. See, good and godly people do fail. To admire and to honor and respect those who live a effectively touch others is very biblical, but to deify any man or any woman is not. When you exalt someone, you begin to expect perfection from that person. And that expectation promises only disillusionment. Only God is perfect and everyone else, everyone else, whatever their age, whatever their position, only God is perfect. Often people avoid Christianity because of the failures of so many ones who profess to be Christians. But it's important to remember that Christians are not perfect, only forgiven. We don't reject God when human beings disappoint us. God never intended any human to be defiled and to be deified. We need to grapple with this reality of our own humanity. You see, each one of us fail daily and weekly and continually. All people do 
even the godly. So let's look in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, as we see this great failure of this man of God, Abraham, who's called Abram at this time. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but you they will let live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why didn't you say, why did you say she is my sister so that I took her into my, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they set him on his way and his wife and everything he had. Well, Abram's in a very tight situation, and he panics. He surely is the friend of God. That's how he's described in the Bible in James chapter 2, verse 23. But he did fail. And there are reasons why he did it. First of all, I believe that this was a divine test for Abram. And God gives us divine tests, not to uh, hurt us, but to help us to grow. Things were dried up in the promised land. Days passed by with no rain. The sun seared the earth and the plants dried up. Abram was concerned. His concern was, we need food. And so he made a decision. He had a survival plan. I know that all of us, as we've gone through this social distancing, and some people have lost their jobs, and we have just, our world's been turned upside down, uh, we've had to make a lot of decisions. And as a Christian, it's so important for us to not do what Abraham did. Abraham made this decision thinking it through, but nowhere do we find that he consulted God. In verse 10 it says, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. There's no hint that Abraham prayed. There's no hint that Abraham turned to God during this famine to bring rain. Abram panicked. He looked at this harsh environment, and he considered what uh, possible options for, were for him, and he decided, I'm going to go to Egypt. Now remember, God did not tell him to go to Egypt. Abraham made that decision. What would have happened if he wouldn't have? I have no idea. But I do know this. God takes care of his children. Well, we have to acknowledge some of life's difficulties. And God invites each of us into the soothing light of his grace. He helps us through our trials and he comforts us in our sorrows. He frees us from these pressures of life. But sometimes that's not instantaneously. And it takes faith to continue to do what God wants us to do. Well, Abram decides to exit the promised land. He looks for relief in Egypt. He has no, we have no immediate indications that God was, uh, was displeased. And, and God did not stop him. Uh, disease did not cripple him. But Egypt was not the real estate that God had promised Abram. Sometimes I've talked to people who've made some very unwise, unspiritual decisions. And often they are mad at God. Why didn't God stop me? Why didn't he do something? I'm going to tell you, the Bible says, there's no temptation taking you that is not common to man. But God is faithful and just. He's faithful and just to help us through those temptations. But the problem is, God sounds the alarm and we disconnect it. The Bible tells of other men of faith who chose compromise. It's easy to choose compromise in the world that we live in. Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh as God commanded, he secured passage to four away Tarshish. The legendary strongman Samson lingered in the Philistine valley of Sorek and risked his power to a scheming woman. David's rooftop patio afforded an excellent view of the city 
and of another person's wife. And the door of lust opened and closed almost silently for a while. Solomon involved himself with many foreign women. He was a king, the son of David. And under his leadership, the kingdom's riches increased. Who would have suspected that the world's greatest, wisest person would be destroyed by his unwise decisions? Each of these individuals made decisions that eventually brought them personal tragedies. Such decisions are like shackles and a ball and chain about your ankle. You might manage okay at first, but soon fatigue sets in. Eventually, even walking becomes difficult. If you're listening and you're out of the will of God, or maybe you've made some decisions that were unwise, not prayed about, I thank God that God can't give us do-overs, but God does give us start-overs. And so maybe that ball and chain is great with you. And I want to tell you, God does not leave us nor forsake us. Does God get disappointed with us? I believe absolutely. Do you ever get disappointed in your children? Absolutely. But when we get disappointed in our children, we don't throw them to the dogs and neither does God. God lovingly calls us back. Well, there were some consequences of his decision. Abram's rattle chain, a poor judgment, a shackle to Sarai's life as well. You see... She was a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians saw her, the word went out, whoa, you need to see this beautiful woman that's with this guy named Abram. Her name is Sarai. And so some of the nobles or some others heard it, and Pharaoh got word of this. And Pharaoh says, oh, hey, I want to see this woman. And when he did, he took her into the palace to eventually for her to become his wife. Sarai agreed to Abram's request, and by so doing, played into the snares of deceit. Everybody saw how beautiful she was. And as I said, she was taken to Pharaoh's house. Abram realized a profit from the sacrifice of Sarai's personal integrity. Now, think about this for a moment. It's amazing what people will do for security. It's amazing what people will do for money. And so Sarai, who was Abram's wife, was living in Pharaoh's castle with all the concubines. Now, she had not become intimate with the Pharaoh at this point. But how could Abraham sleep at night knowing where his wife was? But Abram looked and he said, look, look at how I'm increasing. Look at how much more livestock I have. Look at how many more servants I had. And it took his eyes off of God and godliness. Satan is a great deceiver. And he'll take, he'll cause us to take our eyes off of the Lord and put it on things that we shouldn't. On the surface, Abraham prospered, but like so many compromising businesses and personal decisions, the aftertaste was not as sweet as he expected. You see, the Lord struck Pharaoh in his house with a great plague because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Pharaoh was an innocent party here. Yet his household became a disastrously affected by Abram's decisions. The whole scene doesn't seem fair, does it? Our poor decisions affect more than just ourselves. The ball and chain swings to bruise the ankles of everybody around us. Well, Pharaoh, uh, not aligned with with Abram's God, he knew something was up and, and he calls Abraham on the royal carpet and he says, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you tell me she was your sister? And he said, take her and go. He had had enough. Well, I guess we can applaud Pharaoh, <clears throat> who you would think is an infidel, who didn't know the true and living God, who had more character and integrity than Abram. You see, we have hisses for Abram at this point. Pharaoh was wise enough to deal immediately with the injustice this man of God showed to his wife Sarai and to the royal palace. How many non-Christians have been offended by the behavior of Christians? And how many non-Christians have correctly called for accountability in order to stop such shabby behavior? As surely as Abram's feet etched their toes into the king's carpet, Abram must have been embarrassed by this scene. It would seem that he was now in great, greater danger of losing his possessions and his life than from the famine. 
But the king graciously spared him with a biting, get out. And it was a pretty firm one. And Abram and Sarai were on the road again. How much better would it have been if Abram had simply gone to God with his fears and hunger instead of striking out on his own? Brothers and sisters, as we navigate these uncharted waters, let's not navigate it by fear. Let's not let things cause us to react. Let's be prayerful. Let's go to God with our fears and our hunger instead of striking out on our own. You know, you and your family might want to discuss some things. I know that all of us have some failure in our life, and, and often I've shared with people uh, something that I was going to do that would have totally changed our family, that my wife's spirituality kept us from it. Uh, when I was young and going to seminary, I decided that uh, I really would like to be an army chaplain. And so I applied, and lo and behold, I had uh, some injuries from the Navy, and they wavered those, and they said I could come in as a chaplain. And I was so delighted because in my mind, you know, oh, well, if they're going to take me, then this must be God's go-ahead. And so I, I, I shared with Betsy, I said, you won't believe this. I passed my physical and I can go in the army as a captain, as an officer, and, and be a, a chaplain. And Betsy didn't get as excited as I did about it. But I thought, wow, this is going to be a wonderful adventure. She looked at me, and she said this. She said, I will go anywhere that you go if you can look me in the eye and say, God has led you to be a chaplain. She made me mad. Because when I started thinking about it, it was something that I really wanted to do. But it wasn't something God was really leading me to do. Her speaking up kept me from making a major blunder in my life. I could tell you other things of blunders, but that won't serve any purpose. But maybe you want to just sit down with your family and talk to them and see how God is navigating you and your family as we go through these changes. And maybe start thinking a little bit about what life is going to look like in the future for you and your family. And maybe you're watching and you're watching it alone. You're never alone as a Christian because the Lord is always with you. And as long as the Lord gives us breath, he has something for us to do. May we be wise and may we be prayerful and not launch into something that looks good. May we be launched into something that God is leading us in. God bless you.